All right. So um, thank you so much for coming back. Uh, I'm sure we've all enjoyed your presentation so far, and it's great to have you on our panel uh, today. So to give some context uh, and background before we start this discussion, a definition of procrastination is putting off activities that were planned or scheduled for activities that are of a lesser importance. Hmm. Yep, I definitely do that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, St statistics show that... Only uh, over 20% of the population is drastically affected by procrastination. And some say that could even be higher. According to some research, it has more than quadrupled over the past 30 years. And one in five procrastinate so badly that it uh, may be even jeopardising their jobs, their credit, their relationships and even their health. So, uh, my first question to you on our panel today. From this, we can clearly see that procrastination is a problem, but... Do we realise it, or are we just procrastinating? <laughs> um, I'm going to throw it to you first. I wouldn't mind oh. taking a straw poll. We were discussing that stat that you threw out yeah. earlier, about 20% of people procrastinate. Just hands up here if you, on a reasonably regular basis, struggle with making decisions or following through on tasks and getting things done on time. Uh, that looks like ah. more than 20%. Yeah, that's more like 95%. <laughs> that's extraordinary. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, but it does become extremely debilitating, I know, for, uh, for at least 20% of the population where it does impede their capacity to live productively and constructively. I, I think um, we often think about procrastination really in terms of time management. You know, our lives are so cluttered with so much to do um, that we can turn our attention to so many things that we often feel like we're paralysed to know where to begin. And sometimes I think that masks the real underlying um, challenge that we face because I'm convinced that procrastination is much more to do with how we manage our moods than it has to do with how we manage our time. You know, when you think about it, most of us, when we face a task that we put off, in a, in a way, we're kind of almost waiting for our mood to be right. And you know, we feel like it will get on with it, and for some reason we face it, and it doesn't just feel like we're in the mood for it. And the second assumption we have is that sometime in the future that mood will change, and then we can address it. So I think one of the key insights is to try to understand really what's happening to you emotionally rather than looking at the externals around you. Richard, I, I imagine um, in, uh, in your sphere of expertise, there would be, like many of us, lots to do. Do you put a lot off? Procrastinate? Yeah. <clears throat> Pardon me, yes, I do. But I'm, I know that I do, so I try to deal with it. Uh, we were talking about this this morning in preparation for this, and the thing I try to say to myself is the job begun is a job half done, and if I can start it, I'm more or less there to finish it. But I will go to extraordinary lengths if I have a new work to learn, a new work to conduct, I will do anything not to open that score. And <laughs> I'll mow the lawn, I'll wash dishes, I'll iron. You know, I'll do... <laughs> Come over to my place. So... You'll go out into the cornfield looking yeah. for John. <laughs> Join Jeff. But then I, when I start it, I'm OK. It's the getting the start. It's the, mm -hmm. it's the making the start. And I'm actually now teaching myself to say, don't be lazy. I actually say to myself, don't be lazy. Do it. Mm. Um, so what do you think helps, helps us start? I mean, if that's the preface that we're saying that it's, you know, once we're into it, we can complete the task, what do you think is, you know, the thing that helps us to actually start? Personally, um, as an example, when, when I was living in the cave, then, you know, there wasn't much opportunity for exercise. So I used to do an hour and a half of yoga every day. And I hate yoga. <laughs> <laughs> and not that I don't know it's good for you, of course. That's why I did it. But nonetheless, I learned that the first thing is never to ask yourself, do I feel like it? Mm. Because we know what the answer to that will be. So you just don't ask. You know, whatever the situation, you put down your yoga mat and you just start. Uh, because as soon as we ask ourselves if we feel like it, we're lost. Yeah, 
Right. It's very true. I know that I can schedule my time on my, on my calendar and it's got lots of pretty colours and all the, the yoga, the walking, the swimming, everything that I plan looks fantastic. I'm incredibly organised. But that moment that comes in, oh, I don't feel like going for a swim. You know, it's dark, it's cold or whatever. So that's quite key. Is if, even if I register I don't feel, it's like, well, who asked you? Get up anyway. <laughs> so just go past the feeling yeah. and not respond don't to that. Don't ask that question. Don't ask the question. Does it come down to routine? Well, I, I think it is. If you look at sort of people who perform at the elite level, you know, we're always inspired by athletes, for example, or in the world in which I work, I work with some, some top athletes, but also at the top end of corporate life where people have to perform ex uh, in, under enormous pressure. Um, I, I've learned from them, I suppose, that none of them really wait until they're inspired to get on. They, they, they've established over the course of life a series of, of practices or, you know, habits. Uh, and it's almost like they're on automatic pilot. They, they have a, a, a very clear vision of what it is they're trying to achieve, but on the day-to-day, -day, quotidian, daily grind, there's a, a series of habits. And I think, you know, for us to imagine that we wait for inspiration each time we commit to a task that's unpleasant. And I, I like uh, Richard's point, actually, because it, it really is borne out by, back in the 1920s, the Zyganic effect, uh, this Russian psychologist noticed that if you give people puzzles and uh, you interrupt them halfway through before they finish them and tell people to stop, 90% of people will continue the puzzle to the end. There's something that triggers in the brain once you get started that you want to see it through. And I thought you put it quite well through. And, and I think that's true. So I, I think it is about getting started. And then the second thing, I think it's about establishing ritual and habit rather than waiting for inspiration. Do all, I was just going to say, uh, for all the reasons that we might procrastinate, what I'm hearing, do most of those probably come from within as opposed to forces outside of our control? Mm. Yeah? Definitely, for, I, there's uh, no one else to blame but me. I mean, if I don't do something, it's not somebody else's fault. Mm. It's going to be my fault. I think Martin's point about practicing is really interesting, like a really interesting thing, because although I don't practice, I'm not a professional pianist in the sense of a concert pianist, but if I don't play now, I'd nearly go mad. I think I have to do it now. And if I have a couple of days where I don't actually touch a keyboard, I'm very, very touchy. So it's a, that's a habit of actually playing the keyboard, playing music all the time. And it's a very interesting, um, I think it was Solomon, uh, Concert Peter Solomon, who said, talking about practice and uh, how important it was, talking to a group of students about practicing. Um, it's the most difficult thing with, with children and music is practice. So Solomon said, if I don't practice for one day, I know. If I don't practice for two days, my fingers know. If I don't practice for three days, the world knows. <laughs> That's good. So That's it, good. it was a practice. This thing about practice is right. Think of all those kids who get up at half past four in the morning and go up and down mm -hmm. swimming pools mm -hmm. before school. Mm -hmm. Good luck to them. But I mean, <laughs> they're dedicated. They practice. They do things. They practice. They put it the hard yards. Yeah, but that's because they like it. And that's because they have an interest. Yes. I think a lot of our procrastination is dealing with um, things which we know we should do that in our heart of heart we don't really want to do. And so we have to motivate ourselves. Um, whereas for things which we really love to do, nobody has to make us. We, we, we just you know, do it even if outwardly other people might think that, how can you do that? You know, like getting up very early to do uh, meditation practice or exercise or whatever, it, or, you know, as a musician to practice. But there's a joy there, mm -hmm. so nobody has to uh, force. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to things which we'd really rather not do, but, you know, we have to do, that's when the problem comes. Mm -hmm. Tenzin, you mentioned earlier when we were speaking um, before that when you have a sense of community mm -hmm. around doing the activity, mm -hmm. such as meditating mm -hmm. at five in the morning, mm -hmm. that it becomes an easier task to do because there is a group energy involved. Well, there's no personal choice. I mean, we were talking earlier, and I was saying that, for example, in our nunnery, uh, which is mostly uh, young girls and teenagers and girls in their 20s, um, they have to get up at five o'clock in the morning and do an hour's ritual and then half an hour of meditation and then 
half an hour of yoga before breakfast. Nobody asks them if they feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> and so they do it because everybody does it and it's not a question of choice. Mm. That makes life much easier. Mm. But when we're by ourselves and we have to motivate ourselves, it gets more difficult. Mm. Um, so would you say, I'm just having a look through here, Martin, perhaps you can answer this one. Um, are there diagnosed conditions in which procrastination is an actual symptom of when you get into the whole mental health side? Yeah, of I think so. I think it's, it's, a, it's a feature of certain conditions. For example, the 20% that you, you mentioned, very often the, the people who fall into that category suffer from some form of anxiety disorder to some degree, either at the obsessive compulsive end, you know, where we... Um, we may have perfectionist tendencies, and so that feeds into procrastination because we, we really don't believe that we can complete the task to the standard that we, we need it to be completed at. As a consequence, it, we avoid, um, and the anxiety associated with completing it, primarily maybe because it will confirm that we may not be as competent as we might be. So it, you see it in, the, in that way, I think. I think you also see it in the obsessive-compulsive mind as well when uh, people find decision-making quite difficult. They're almost looking for a template that they can put over life that will prescribe what to do so that I'm absolved of responsibility, of choice. And so then it becomes a sort of struggle of the will, I think, and we often think about procrastination as willpower and discipline. I'm inspired by Jet, Jet Sommer, really, because I'm not a big believer in discipline. I've really found it quite difficult, you know. Uh, and I like the idea that this emerges from within, I think, but that it's with, it, you need social support, which, which then makes it much easier to commit. The other sort of spectrum of disorder I think we see it emerging is in the mood disorders or in depression. Um, people almost get um, disengaged from that source of vitality inside themselves, from basic ego strength, I, I suppose. Um, and as, as a consequence, they find it very hard to initiate. Um, and once you get exhausted, and if your mood drops uh, over the period of several weeks, and you can feel your energy subsiding, um, things can mount up on us, I think. And then it's very difficult to, uh, to bring the focus of will and the focus of energy to those tasks. And I think you see procrastination in sort of both of those spectrums, really. Mm. Um, in one study done by a procrastination research group, in actual fact, it was a two-month study that took them five years. <laughs> um, <laughs> They looked, they looked at 374 undergraduates and found that students who put things off were more likely to eat poorly, sleep less, uh, drink more than other students who actually did homework promptly. I'm just wondering, where does procrastination start? Is it a learnt behaviour from uh, the parents or is it something which is inherently part of us being human? Where did it start for you, Richard? At school. Ah. At, at school? At school, yeah, because we had... Uh, I mean, my school was hardly exemplary, but we, the idea of doing homework, we, ha we had homework every single night, a lot of homework, and I would come home and not do the homework, and then I would say, I'd make a rule, I will do the homework the minute I come home, and then I would get home and I'd say, no, I'll do it after I've played for an hour and a half with my friends, and then I would do it after tea, and then I'd be too tired, then I'd get up early in the morning and do it, and then I would finish up doing it a little bit on the train, on the way to school. And we actually, in my, in my school, I, I was a group of four, and we actually had, we devised a plan whereby we did each other's homework. So <laughs> I did all the English, history and French, Someone else did all the chemistry and physics, and someone else did all the maths. I failed chemistry, physics, and maths. <laughs> I'd passed English history and French. So. But that was, that was actually really good, that having that sort of... We were cooperative. Cooperation. We were cooperative. Uh, is, it, is it that same thing? Is it, you know, like, it, someone else's chips always taste better than yours? So always. is that why yeah. you did someone else's? Homework? But it was, I learned it at school. There's no question about that. Yeah. And being caned did not stop us. Uh. So be, we were caned every day. I mean, I was caned every day of my life from the age of seven to the age of uh, 16. I really was, in my last year of school particularly. And we were caned for not doing homework, but it didn't stop me. 
I mean, once you got the cane, the pain finished in a few minutes, it was better than homework. So... <laughs> <laughs> that's where I learned to procrastinate. So, well done, Morris <laughs> Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Tenzin, from, from a spiritual point of view, where, where does procrastination start? Or? Well, we hope it doesn't start. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think one of the, the, the points is what uh, was mentioned before, that one can get into... There's a certain commitment. For example, the most procrastination is for people wanting to get up and meditate or do their practice or to study. And, and so that if you, one has a, a commitment to do that, especially if you're having a hard time, then to take a commitment in front of somebody you really respect so that you, you make a commitment that you're going to get up, say, at, at you know, 3 o'clock in the morning or 5 or 6 or whenever, uh, and do a certain amount of practice. Then, um, uh, as you're saying, once you get started, then it becomes easier, and it becomes a habit, because we have the habit to procrastinate, but we can also have the habit to uh, go forward and do things even if inwardly one doesn't really want to do it. So it's a matter, again, of, of, of creating you know, a pattern we get into uh, negative patterns, we can also create positive patterns. Do you think the, um, the payoff of, of, of the ritual of doing it again and again, that eventually we begin to feel the benefit, so therefore the procrastination is less because it's like, well, actually I'm feeling better and I have more energy by the end of the day, which reinforces that getting up early or, you know, do you think the payoff actually helps to, to put oh, off the yes, procrastination? Oh, yes, I think so. But also because, as I say, if you're in a situation where you don't have a choice... Uh, like in a monastic situation where you have to do this, you know, it's, it's not, they're not asking you, you know, you, this is what you do. Then you get on a roll, you know, and, and you don't question it, and it's, it's what you do. And then, as you say, because then you, you uh, get the benefits which come from regular practice, regular studies, regular whatever, and so inside you feel that kind of peacefulness and joy from... from uh, living that kind of regular life and not having a backlog of all the things that you know you should be doing that you're not doing. And I think this is one of the reasons why the Buddha himself always praised good companionship. Because if we have friends who say, oh no, don't bother to do that, let's go out and you know, have fun, and then you're persuaded away from what you know you should be doing. But if you have friends who say, oh, let's all come together and we'll study together and we'll practice together and how's your practice going on and encouraging us in, in having a positive lifestyle, then that can be very supportive. I was just thinking back to uh, when you spoke uh, at the start of the day and you said that lots of people come into our life to help us practice. Um, and I'm just wondering from the point of view of, of people who are in relationships with procrastinators or are around work with procrastinators and I think you used the analogy of sandpaper uh, the you know are these people like really coarse sandpaper the procrastinators <laughs> like do they how, how do we as people if you if you're not so much a procrastinator but there is a procrastinator uh, within your circle how do you how do you help them how, how can you help them oh me <laughs> um, um, look, I, I think for me, it's, it's really, I'm a big believer in preparation. Um, and and, and you know, I'm listening very closely to Jet Sumner's comment there about uh, bringing more awareness to the beginning of each day. And I try, I'm amazed how so much of my life I spent just sort of getting out of bed and getting into the day and how beneficial it's been. And I, I, I learned it, I think, a lot from Alan, actually, Alan's teaching. You know, he, he began this morning with um, call to mind your highest aspirations for what, what you want to achieve through this session. And I found that just a remarkably important practice each day to, to call to mind what are my aspirations for the day and then to remind myself of what it is that I want to achieve. And are those first 30 or 60 minutes of each day uh, are remarkably potent, I think, for taking some control and developing some, a level of mastery over life. So trying to anticipate where the distractions are during the day, but what three things do I need to have achieved today in order to have had a good day? Um, and I'm convinced that 
Finally, energy follows focus. Um, and the skills that Jitsuma and, and Alan and others have brought to us are, are so critical as we move in, particularly into the second half of our lives, that we can bring our attention to the things that are of ultimate importance and be less distracted by even people who bring you know, vexation to the soul. <laughs> uh, not taking on board their baggage, but knowing where it starts and where it stops. And I learned this from a psychology friend of mine who, um, I was going to become a lawyer before I got involved in psychology. Hmm. And uh, I went to the university and everybody was out to lunch. So I shot across to the psychology department and I walked up and down the corridors because I had an hour to fill. And there was a door half open. And I walked in and I had a conversation with a psychologist. And four hours later, I came out. And I thought, you know, that's what I want to do. And I remember being with Phil one day. And I sat in his office. And his boss came in and tore strips off him and uh, berated him for about seven or eight minutes and went out and slammed the door. And I was a student sitting there with beetroot red and self-conscious, oh, and the silence fell, and I thought, oh my God, what, what do you say? And Philip looked up to me, and he said, um, Marty said, he's got problems, hasn't he? <laughs> 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 and in that moment, I thought, that's what I want to be like. <laughs> you know, not really taking it on. Oh. And, and I think these skills uh, need to be cultivated over time so that we don't buy in to lots of the, the, the toxins and the things which distract us from the things which are ultimately important to us. So I'm a big believer in preparing the mind at the beginning each day. I mean, what would you say to uh, people that say, you're just being lazy? Uh, are we just being lazy? Or is it... Are you asking me? It's I, I think it is. That's how I interpret it. Yeah. I yeah. call it being lazy. Yeah. And I say to myself, now, don't be lazy. And interestingly enough, it comes from, this is going to sound very out of left field, but it comes from observing people getting older who pay less attention to what they should do in the home. And I'm not going to go into long details, but I think, okay, I've watched that person and it's not going really well. And I don't want to be like that. Mm. I, I don't want to get to 80, which frankly isn't too far away, <laughs> and not know that I should be doing things that would make my life okay when I could do it on the spot. And it's as simple as wiping a glass up or making sure the kitchen's clean mm. or making sure the things are organized. Mm. And, that's, and I, say, I, I say to myself, don't be lazy, and it helps if you're OCD, mm. which I am, okay? So, and it actually drives my wife insane. My wife goes mad because I have a routine in the day that is breathtaking, and <laughs> nobody, nobody can deflect me. So <laughs> breakfast happens at lightning speed the same way every single day. And my wife stopped after 43 years. She just doesn't, she just <laughs> accepts it. <laughs> but there, I, I say to myself, don't be lazy. That's how mm. I describe mm. it. Yeah. For me, I can't solve anyone else's problem in that area. Yeah. And for my students, when I have students who are like this, I'm actually very good at helping them overcome that. Mm. <laughs> Which is, I know it's weird, but it's, it's absolutely true. Mm. It's called fear. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And that wouldn't be your prescription, you know, fear. And <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'm very good at, at encouraging kids to produce work. Yeah. Because the, you get the best from a kid, and it's not, not about procrastination, but it's about letting a kid know that it can be done to some extent. It mightn't always be fabulous, and even if you fail at the task the first time, that doesn't make you a failure. That means we have to learn something from that task. Ah, well, you you put so your we... finger on something there, though, haven't you? Because what I think often feels like laziness, I'm not, I'm, I'm not convinced. I grew up in a situation where I was accused of being lazy all my life. And I thought, I'm not lazy. I think it's a lot more to do with anxiety, you know. Uh, this sort of fear that we have. And that once you do tap in and you remove the fear, uh, I find students and people just really buy in to the, the excitement, really of what they are capable of and what yeah. they can achieve. And I, you know, I imagine that you're very good at that, to be honest. Yeah. Well, I like to think I can get the best from people in that circumstance. Yeah. Yeah. And also in the, in the, the lesson circumstance, it's, a, it's about um, empowering the child, or empowering the child to feel that 
what the child has to say, I'm actually interested in. Even if it's rubbish, I'm interested in. <laughs> no, but it's really important. I mean, getting kids to speak is really important. You don't want to say, no. You don't want to stop the thought process. You're happy to take the thoughts, even if it amounts to a pooling of ignorance. But you still you want them to give stuff. You want them to do that. And a lot of them, this fear thing comes out yeah. a lot in that. I know it's got a little bit of procrastination, but the fear thing is part of that. But what you're saying there is you have the belief, in, you, you speak or see the belief in them, and that probably pulls them out of procrastination, hmm. in a sense, yeah? No, yeah. So. yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, it's easy to beat up on yourself, isn't it? That's the thing. Yeah. I think we all have this tendency to sort of become self-critical and, uh, and it, it really does us no good in the end. I think we're far better to pause and just try to observe what it is we're feeling. That gives you a little bit of a window sometimes into what is the anxiety, why am I lacking in motivation, to, uh, and, and then calling to mind what's the value of what it is that I'm, I'm trying to achieve and reminding ourselves of that. But it's all too easy, I think, to um, be critical of ourselves rather than trying to remove you know, the obstacle. Uh, so we, we procrastinate about looking at what the issue is. That's it, yeah. So, And if we don't identify the anxiety that's preventing us, then we can't unlock it. So it. I know that um, for me, procrastinating about going to the dentist every single oh, year, I yeah. mean, like months, push it off, push it off, push it off. And I needed some major work done and I finally made the appointment. Mm. And the amount of energy that was released just simply because I made the call, I hadn't even gone yet, yeah. but I'd made the call, I'd taken the action, like you were saying, that first step, that first step that then yes. breaks down the resistance. And of course it was anxiety, it was, yes. it was definitely about fear. But then when I had it done and did it, oh, I was off like a train, <laughs> it was yeah, all yeah. good. So yeah, I think recognizing the anxiety and what's That's preventing it. you from taking that step. And if you can name what it is, you can step past it, take that first step, and then it can unfold. Yes. Mm. So in, in wrapping up, I suppose I'd like to, uh, we'd like to ask each of you, um, in regards to press, uh, procrastination, what you would like the, these people to leave with, to remember from this session. Okay, well, well I'm encouraged that um, Richard says that he doesn't practice very much. Uh, and I think I'd encourage you, mate, if you do practice, you'd be quite good. <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinary. But uh, for me, I think it's what I've learned, I think, from listening to, to Alan over the years and, and others is that focus, the capacity to focus is more important than intelligence uh, when it comes to achieving what it is you're capable of achieving, I think. Tinsy? Yeah, I will carry that on. I think that, you know, the more we become conscious and mindful in our day, the less we are likely to put off tasks which maybe we don't uh, consciously particularly want to do because we're aware of the resistance and therefore we're also conscious of how to open up and just go forward. So uh, mindfulness is the mindfulness. answer okay. to that. Richard? And I think you have to also be easy on yourself and say, I've done that task, I feel good about that. <laughs> I actually have done that. Hmm. That's one thing I have done. And Martin's idea of focus I love, which we use in music all the time as listen. The listening thing is what creates the focus. Hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please thank our panellists, Richard Tenzin and Martin, as they leave the stage. Thank you very much. By the time we're 60, more than 90% of us will have known someone close to us who has suffered from some sort of a neurological disorder. You all know you're not going to live forever. There's only one way into this life and one way out. I cannot prove to you anymore that anything is possible. Talk about the marvelous thing that we now understand about our brains. It gets so much better.